committee. My name is Kashika Patel and I'm the Deputy uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Equality and Diversity at the University and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun, uh, a lot of chat, Ivan and I have already been chatting so uh, you might have to stop us if you've got any questions. We will remember that you're there. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to Ivan before we launch into some um, challenging questions about the last two years for Ivan. So to start with, uh, good morning to you all. And this is our second of our leadership series of talks. We started the series last week hearing from Sir Peter Salisbury, who is the Mayor of Leicester. And it was genuinely compelling to hear him talk through the past couple of years and how he handled the pressures of leading Leicester through the pandemic. But tonight's guest was arguably closer than anyone to what was really happening in the city throughout the near constant lockdowns imposed on Leicester from early 2020 onwards. Professor Ivan Brown is Leicester City Council's Director of Public Health, a job which he took on in 2019, but he did previously serve as the deputy to that role since 2016. Before that, he worked as a consultant in public health in Leicester from 2009. He also, we're very proud to be able to say, works with us here at DMU, sharing his vast experience with our students as professor in public health practice. So every ounce of that experience has been put to the test over the past couple of years. It was Professor Brown's job to spearhead the city's response to COVID-19 pandemic, using local data to inform the city's strategic plans. His team had to make and communicate difficult decisions to often dramatically affect, which often dramatically affected the day-to-day -day lives of our people in Leicester. And all of this had to be done while maintaining the ongoing delivery of our routine health services within the city. But proving the old axiom that there are no challenges, only opportunities, Professor Brown and his team excelled, pioneering projects to tackle the virus in built-up areas, including a local test and trace scheme, which would then be replicated in many cities throughout the country. So as Director of Public Health, Professor Brown is responsible for public health services within the city and has the duty to improve public health across Leicester, and that literally is quite your job description, isn't it? That's, that's what you do. So what does it feel like to try and achieve this during a global pandemic in a city that has been under national scrutiny for the condition of its public health? How do you decide as a leader what to prioritise and when everything is a priority? And how do you keep a work-life balance when the two have to be meshed so totally together? So that's what we're here to find out tonight. So can I ask everyone to please welcome Professor Ivan Brown. So I'm going to give him an easy one to start with, the, you know, the classic, let's warm you up into it. So before the pandemic started, you started in 2019 as the director. And then a year later, you launched into COVID-19. But was there anything in your career prior to all of that that prepared you for this unwarranted event? I, th I think that um, thinking about being prepped for a pandemic, no, I, I think that, 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 that's, that, that's pretty clear. But actually thinking about the, the principles that prepare you uh, to, to, to do that, there's a huge amount in terms of response is about people. It's about, uh, it's about connection, it's about how you get on, it's how you link up with people. And I think that all through whatever job that I've been doing, that has always been really quite key for me, about how you, how you make that connection with with other, with other people. And I think there's, that's, that's what you bring in, in terms of your, in, your entire life. Um, so it's not just in a work setting, but also in social settings. About, in, in my own community, you know, you were always given a little task to do, whether you were doing it within your, your community or within your church or within your, you know, out with your friends. But they all feel like small things at the time. Um, but you, you pull on absolutely everything when, when you're faced with something like that. I remember before that um, there we, we sort of had the, the, the swine flu, if people remember, um, and we thought that was going to be the big one. That's the thing that's going to drop. Um, uh, and I remember working with a, a, a DPH in the county, and I was his deputy at that time dealing with that. And I was thinking, Phew, 
hope I'll never have to deal with one of those, you know, again, at the scale, at the scales it was. Um, and interestingly, when the pandemic hit, uh, he came back and worked with me uh, as part of it. But it, we, we learned a lot of the lessons that we used there. We applied, we applied here. So you never know when it's coming through. But yeah, I, I think there are things that I can absolutely see of, of lines that were, were, were preparing me to do this. Brilliant. One of the things we were talking about earlier um, was that moment. So we're talking about leadership here. And, you know, the pandemic has been, has really drawn on you having to, to draw on that leadership skills. But we were talking about the difference between management and leadership yeah. and managing a crisis, but leading through a crisis. But you were talk telling me about that moment where you had that moment of this is leadership. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, uh, fortunately, I've got one of the, my, my, my previous bosses here. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that I was a reluctant uh, director of public health. I thought, I'm quite happy being a consultant. You're just underneath the radar. Uh, and there's all this issue about because you've got to manage this and you've got to write these reports and you've got to do all of that, which were not the most joyous parts of, of the work for me. I thought I, I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I was really anxious going into the job in 2019 around management. But I thought I've got a fantastic team and they kind of pushed me forward and that's what I would do. The moment that I realised, I can actually pinpoint the second that I realised that I was in a leadership role as opposed to a management role. And it was when the announcement came that Leicester City, uh, and actually some of the boundaries of Leicester were in a local lockdown. And I was used to doing a little bit of media, not really phased by it totally. Uh, and so Peter said, oh, we've got to go and speak to the press. It's much easier if we do it in, in one setting, one press conference, as opposed to, you know, doing lots and lots of uh, separate conferences. When I went down there, anybody who knew, knows the City Council, there's a big hall in there called Attenborough Hall, and it was full of the media. I mean, live streaming on Sky, live streaming on the BBC, Al Jazeera, New York Times. It was this... I had this podium, and you see those when, the, when people... And it was just full of microphones. Uh, and, and I was OK, because Sir Peter was talking, and I was like, he's the lead. And then at the end of it, Sir Peter just went, so now I'm going to hand over to our Director of Public Health. And it was that moment when I stood up, I was like, right, this is it. You know, everybody is now looking at you. And this is now a leadership piece. This is about what am I going to say to the city first of all, but actually to the country about my city, about what we are going to do next. And that was about leading the narrative that I wanted to be pursued for Leicester, leading the narrative about what we were going to do. And that's when I knew at that moment, I'm not a manager anymore. I'm not even a director. I am, I am now a, a leader in this position. Brilliant. So I want to take it back to, we were under the spotlights quite a lot throughout the pandemic. And then we were under the spotlight for, for looking at particular issues and areas that are particular to our city. So as the cases grew across the country, we started to hear about the impact of COVID on particular communities. And the data seemed to be showing the differential impacts on different ethnic communities um, and also in the socioeconomic groups. So knowing the demographic of our city, you, you were born here, you've grown up here, you've, you know, you've come back to do your career here, you, you know Leicester and its demographics. So how did you take your leadership, take what you'd learned from the previous role, sent it around the avian flu, and, and what we'd started to understand about how COVID was hitting different communities, and how did you translate that to Leicester's demographics and how you as a leader were going to lead us through or understand what was happening in our city? So, so I think that when... When that data started to come through, in fact, it wasn't even data at the beginning. It was, it was really people having conversations and saying, oh, it looks like the profile of people that are most affected are, you know, from a, from a black community or from a different community or from a deprived. So we had this kind of feed that was coming through. The minute that you start to hear that, your, your ears prick up because, first of all, that's your community. So that's radar one secondly it's leicester you know it's it's leicester we we look different to other parts of the of, of the country so i immediately was starting to think about what does that impact look like how is that going to be played out 
here. Uh, and I must admit, being one of the, at that time, being a, a director of public health for a year, your plan is, your hope is, that let it happen somewhere else first, and we'll just follow the blueprint that, that, that's already been laid out. But when it's you first, you're having, to, you're having to, to set that agenda, and you're having to take your city along with you, and you're having to recognize the, the, the communities and the differential impact that that's having on communities and how they feel about that. So there's a huge piece that had to be done about saying, I hear it, you know, I hear it, I'm worried about it, I'm anxious about it for a city, and it is in the forefront of my mind. We didn't even know what we were dealing with at that time. So you couldn't make a promise to say, and this is what we're going to do. It was, uh, people want to know that they have been heard. People want to know that this issue is not going to be something you push aside, but in whatever you do, you're going to, you're going to bring that to the fore. So I think that for me, that was one of the, the key elements was to say, I, I hear this, I see this, I'm invested in this, uh, and be sure as can be, but I'm going to be looking and trying to, to make sure that we, we manage it. So taking that a step further, last week we heard from Sir Peter about some of the um, information that was being shared around the country about why in Leicester, why some communities might be more affected, the living conditions, the extended families, the religious festivals, the sweatshops. There was all this information coming out and you were heading up and leading, positioning Leicester. So two questions from that, in terms of how did you lead through that, but also, you know, very much your identity as a senior black leader in a city which has a majority of a, a black and Asian population. Did you find that that allowed you to be an authentic leader moving through that? Yeah, I think, I think for me, when, when, when the city were, were, were put into its lockdown, Remember, this was 135 cases per 100,000. Remember, <laughs> well, that, those are figures that now everybody would, would give their you know, high teeth for. But that was the, the position we were in when we were put into lockdown, not the thousands that, that, that we have, we've seen. Uh, and it was interesting because part of the response was a national response. You were the epicentre, and, the, and the, the response was, we will send in people to help you. We will send in a regional team to help you. We will send in national people to help you. We will do all of this. But the problem with that is they don't know Leicester. They know it, they know it from a, a geographical and, a, and an epidemiological point of view, but they don't understand the city. When you're trying to deal with something like this, you have to understand community. You have to understand how communities work, how they operate, what people's individual... Um, ways of being are. So when I started to hear, oh well, you know, from the, from almost from the national team, oh it must be, it must be Eid, or, or, or it must be, you know, the sweatshops that you have within this. My first thought is I was personally affronted by it. That, that was my, my, my first feeling was a bit, how dare you, um, if I were to be candid about it, because not only did I not feel that the data supported that, I, I, I am a person, my job is to look at the information, look at the data, I'm not going to hide away from it. But just basic logic said to you, looking at where the cases were, uh, looking, and if you understood that in a lot of those areas, people were not all the people working in that sort of industry, they weren't all in that sort of area, it can't be that on its own, it just can't be. So. I'm not saying we rule it out, but I'm saying that we, we have to stop and look further. So I think for me, it was that kind of understanding of our communities, of this city and the way that this city operates, that allowed me and others, to be fair, that were in the city to say no. You know, I know that that's what you want to put out, but actually we don't agree that that's the narrative. And if you get that wrong, it's divisive. If you get that wrong, you create problems in this city that go way beyond COVID or anything else. So this issue around being an advocate for your community was, was absolutely key. Do I think that, that being a black man who was born in the city helped? Absolutely. I, gen, I genuinely do. Um, and I say that because people told me so. You know, People have come up to me as I've walked through town and said, 
yeah, I wasn't too sure about that, but I know you, you know, or you speak like us or you look like us. It makes a difference, you know. I think representation is not just something that's nice to have in times like this. It's, it's a necessity, and we've had really difficult conversations and challenging conversations with, with parts of my own community that, that don't want to do certain things. And we might respectfully agree to disagree, but I get through the door to at least have the conversation. And I think that's key. But that's a whole different set of leadership skills because you, you and your team were challenged from a national perspective, being told what was happening in our city. So that's a whole different set of, of leadership skills you were having to draw, apart, draw upon. And what did you kind of learn for yourself about yourself and how you were, how you were leading or how you could lead to get an if to get heard that you're not right, this is, we're standing our ground? Well, I think, I think first of all, uh, I realised that, I would like to say that I was more resilient than I thought I was, but actually what I realised is that I had far more capital and support than I thought that I ever had. So um, I had colleagues that I'd worked for, worked with in the past, who said, oh, I'll come in and give you a hand, or or, or who would pick up the phone and say, yeah, I've heard that. What do you People who would just wrap themselves around you. So you never, I never think that I felt that I was on my own doing this. I never felt that this was just me being belligerent or, or anything like that. And even at those moments when I felt weak, actually I had people around me saying, you can and you will do this. Um, so I can't, and I, I don't say that in some kind of false humility, you can't go through something like this. You can't lead in that way without having a really strong group of people around you. And so that point about what prepared you, what are the things that you did to prepare, you didn't, I didn't go out to do that, but what I had is all of those interactions, all of those, those times that I've spent time talking to people, spending time, we've done things together, you cash that in, you get the opportunity to cash that in. And, and, and I think that, that I definitely pulled on that and I have been pulling on that for two years at least. Brilliant. I'm going to take you back to something that you said, which I think is really important when we talk about leadership. And you would said that those moments when you felt weak and those people that wrapped around you that said you can do it, you know, it's often suggested that leaders can't show weakness, can't show vulnerability. But do you think showing vulnerability is also a sign of strength and a sign of leadership to recognise that you need support and Absolutely. I think I'm, I'm, I'm of the, the opposite. I think it's actually dangerous. I think I find it more dangerous when you have a leader who would indicate that they have got the answer to everything. I think there's a difference between being, being calm and assured, and I do try to project, you know, that we've got this. You know, City, we've, 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 we've got this. Um, but really recognising that... I will have moments of weakness and my team have been unbelievable and there's somebody uh, that I've just online it's a guy called Graham I don't know if you're listening Graham but but Graham um, would write me an email he just clearly just got my email from somewhere he'd write me an email and he'd say just to say Ivan seen you really like what you're doing what do you think is happening with this and we've just got into this conversation around this is where it is. And he would always sign off, really proud of you, really proud of your team. Keep doing what you're doing for Leicester. You know, things like that are the things that like, all right, OK, had a really crap day. <laughs> but you know what? This is all right. And, you know, and I've had cards from people that's like, just keep going. Of course, you get all the other stuff as well. But those, those, those moments make a huge difference. And that leads so nicely into that, that next question that we, you and I touched on previously, that that you are not just a leader, but you um, have a home life, you have a, a private life, you are a face of the city at this point, people are seeing you all over the news, um, but you have to go, you go home and you need to have a space to unwind and be with your family. How did you manage, because actually you probably couldn't because it was all in the news, <laughs> so how did you manage that? How did you manage that? So, so I mean, I just have to say you know, um, that my, my wife, so we're all the kind of involved, because my wife is a, is, a, is a local GP as well. And, um, and we have two boys um, who, you know, are completely 
pandemic, whatever, we are meant to go out kind of situation. Uh, and, and I, particularly in those early, uh, the, the, when we were really in the spotlight, it was literally work until two o'clock in the morning, grab a couple of hours, wake up the next morning to prepare for what was coming. And, and what happens is, you know, your partner carries it. You know, they, they carry it. And, uh, and Linda was very much kind of, we need to get through this. But I think the, diff the, the thing was, there was an understanding that she knows that this city is in my heart. And this wasn't just a job. And she knew, if I don't feel that I've given this absolutely everything, it's not the risk of failure. It's the risk of thinking I could have done more. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that when she got to, when she understood that if I didn't get through that, I, she's going to, I'm going to be grumpy for a long time. I'm <laughs> going to be even grumpier for even longer. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really difficult. In terms of the boys, uh, to be honest, I feel like I still owe them two years. Yeah. I just feel like I do because I'm, I'm always, I was always out and doing and, and, you, and you get quite short around stuff as well. Um, uh, but you know, that's where your family comes, your friends come around, and they, they take up the slack. They kind of say, I'll, you know, I'll take the boys swimming and I'll do this. They create, they create some space for you. And I've got a few friends that are like, they're like uh, GP receptionists. <laughs> <laughs> they create, they are the Rottweilers at the front that say, no, don't give him that. No, he's busy doing that. Just to create that, that kind of space. So all of those things absolutely helped me through. And, uh, and I've, I've had a, a number of times where people said, well, just how have you, you kept going? And it's been, it's been that, you know. So leading in a crisis has, has, has obviously impacted on families, developed your skills. But um, there's been some interesting humorous elements to it as well. Your, your work, walk to work where people know when you're walking down the street, your trips to Marks and Spencers, share a bit of that with us. So, so I think one of the things is, I think my, I think my name is now, you're that bloke off the telly. Um, so very often I, 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 I walk into work, particularly in the early, and I had to factor in additional time for my walk to work and my walk back from work because somebody would invariably stop me and would say, so how's it going then? What do our figures look like? So off the, off the top of your head, you have to say, well, we're here and we're doing this. And then it'd be, when will I be able to fly? Are we in lockdown? Can my kids go to school? So you would be doing this on your walk. And the best place was Marks and Spencers. Marks and Spencers was unbelievable. So if, when I went into Marks and Spencers, the first time I, in the midst of the crisis, because busy, busy, when I started to get a bit of a gap, I was able to go and get some lunch from Marks and Spencers. I just got surrounded by the, these people that were in Marks and Spencers that were just saying, oh, yes, you, Professor Brown, anyway. And, and then there'd be somebody tugging somebody away and saying, no, let me just ask him about my neighbour. And this is particularly the one where you, when it was about, you know, reporting people if they had not complied. My neighbour had this party on the such and such day. And can you, and, you know, and, and, I, and I, don't get me wrong, I, I love, that is my favourite part of doing this job without a shadow of a doubt. Meeting people in Leicester, and, and particularly for me, being a Leicester person, you know, being able to have conversations with people in the city about this fact that I can particularly help with. I can't necessarily help you with all the stuff that, that, that came. I, I, I think I've got one that's in my email box this, that I, just before I came, which was about a cat defecating on a lawn in front of their, in front of their, their house. But now I am Mr. You know, Mr. Public Fix Health, <laughs> Mr. Fix-It. So yeah, I, I, I get a lot of that, and I, and I, and, um, but I do like it. I do, I do enjoy that part. It makes it feel like what you're doing is real and tangible. Excellent. So the question which you have to be asked, and, and you know, I'd be remiss to not ask you, is now that we're being told um, to live with COVID, how are you and your team, the council, looking at how are we going to manage that? What will our public health look like? What should we be thinking about? What should we be moving forward to? And what, and what are the next steps for your leadership in this? I think this, this, this is a really great question because it does talk about this issue around leadership and management. 
I think previously, when there was all the guidelines that were in place, it was frustrating because the guidelines, the announcements would be made, and then the guidelines would come after the announcement, and then you'd have to interpret the guidelines and tell people what was going on and what was happening. But it felt like you were doing something, you were, you were managing it, you were dealing with it, you could give people something tangible. Um, with the removal of all of that, particularly when you, you know and you feel that there's still a long way to go on this journey, it then becomes about pure leadership. Because I can't compel people to do it, because there's no, there's no legal requirement for people to do it. So how do I have a conversation with, with a city or a citizen to say, I know it's been so long now, I know it's been you know, well over a year and you still haven't had your vaccination, I still think it's mightily important that you do, and, and, and it's important for the city and it's important for the community. It does require me to have, use, pull far more on leadership skills, you know, the example skills, the, 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 the dialogue skills, all of those kind of things to, to move, move us forward and to continue to move us forward than perhaps where I was before. But, but it is perhaps the most, the most challenging part even for me, even though it's probably for everybody else, thinking, well, actually, it's less now. On my walk-in, I have to say, on my walk-in, I was told by one of the, my regulars that said, oh, Professor Brown, I heard the announcement. It's all over. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> We've still got a way to go. So, so yeah, continue to pull on that uh, constantly. And I, and, I, and I don't know where it's going to, to go, and I don't know how successful it's going to be, but... I'll be using a lot of those things that we've just spoken about as, as seeing whether we can continue to say, look, we as a city have gone a long way. We cannot afford to go backwards. We've got to continue to, be, to get out of this as quickly as we can so that we can recover as quickly as we can. I just don't want us as a city to be left behind uh, as a result of this. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I could keep talking, but oh, I am conscious um, we, have, we have people yeah. here um, <laughs> that we might need to bring into the conversation. Um, before I do that, though, um, I am going to open up to you all to ask some questions, and I hope you've got some ready. So give you time to think about it. We did have a, a question that was sent in by uh, a student. So uh, Tatwumfa Subanda, who is a nursing student, um, asked, what are the challenges of health education and promotion during the COVID pandemic compared to generally and how did you manage these? It does sound like a bit of an essay question, so you don't have <laughs> yeah, 2,000 yeah. words for that. Yeah, I, I, I see what they're, where they're going. <laughs> I wonder whether that's an assignment. Uh, that's what, it feels yeah. like an assignment piece. Um, but, but, but I think it's, it, it, it's been really interesting from a, 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 from a health education and health promotion perspective, actually, both good and bad. So from a, from a, from a good point of view, we spent, prior to COVID, an inordinate amount of time trying to raise issues of health. Uh, and one of my, my favourite and most frustrating um, examples is I remember, that, and I put this down to the editor of the paper, we managed to get a little bit of a, a, a press coverage around obesity and a programme that we were doing in relation to obesity really really chuffed that we'd got this into the paper, got it in the paper. At the same time, on the opposite page was a full-size advert for McDonald's. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. And I just realised, ah, so I've got this and they've got this. And it just felt constantly like, that's what it looks like. That's, that's what health, you know, health promotion looks like in this, this COVID world. So suddenly, to be in a position where you know, I just remember walking into Sainsbury's and seeing my face on the front of the paper because I'd uttered something, you know. A mere utterance about COVID uh, was sufficient to put my face on the front of the paper. I remember doing something. I'd, I'd mentioned something in, a, in something that I'd done for the Royal Society of Medicine, and I was on the, on the front of the Guardian. And, and these were things that were just unheard of. I could, I could have conversations about, about health, that were, that were great, but so that, that was a good side uh, of it. Um, the downside of it now is 
unless it's COVID, nobody's talking to you about it. Uh, and, and, I, and I suppose I have, I have fears about the big things that really impact on the city going forward. You know, mental well-being, cardiovascular health, all of those, those issues, sexual health, alcohol, smoking, all of those things. But you know what? I want to be on the front of the paper to talk about. That I, st I still worry that I'm going to, you know, gradually move further and further back to the kind of comment pieces. So I, I, think, it, I think it's challenging. Um, but I do think that there is a potential platform now probably to try and get some of those things going uh, uh, going forward. I think there's a momentum and recognition that public health, what it is and how important it is. So hopefully that, that platform is going to be there for a long time to come. So thank you very much for answering my questions and I'm going to give the audience an opportunity to ask you questions. Now we have a, a mic, um, so if you have got a question can you wait for the mic to come to you because we have an audience online who would need to be able to hear you as well. So please. Casey. Great, I can thank you so much. Um, it's really inspiring to hear your comments and your reflectiveness actually about the whole process that you've been through. Um, I guess one of the things that um, struck me is that you said uh, near the beginning um, when you talked about your previous experience that you've been working with swine flu and you thought that was going to be the big one. It kind of gives this sense that within the public health world there was always an anticipation that something very large was going to come along. I guess it's interesting just to hear you reflect on that. And in that case, what was being done to prepare for that? Or was it still just a kind of sense that some people held but it wasn't really uh, acknowledged to be a, 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 real, a reality? Thanks. So, so I think, Katie, yeah, absolutely in the public health world, it was always the feeling that we are due, you know. And, and so there was always this look, and I even remember what, during my training, uh, that, that you'd have a risk register, and on that risk register would always invariably be pandemic. Um, but it was one of those things that because it hadn't happened for many years, you know, since the Spanish flu really at scale, it was one of those things that it was good public health practice to, to always be mindful of, always be thinking about, but it didn't really, it didn't really fall into your everyday planning. And then when we started to get some of the, 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 the avian influenzas, uh, there was a real view that it was going to be, it was going to be a, an avian flu. That's what it was going to be. And so there was, there was a real, uh, before, before swine flu, there was a real push around where we think it's going to start probably in, 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 in South Asia, kind of, and it will probably work its way. So we did a lot of planning that, that sat, a, sat around there. And even swine flu kind of caught us a little bit off guard. It wasn't quite what we were expecting. Um, but when it hit, that was, that was it. I think what we didn't really think around in reality was, because uh, we, we've had a few false dawns, you know, we'd had you know, a number of SARS and so forth. Uh, and because we'd had those false dawns, we thought, will this one peter out? Will it just be another one of those that, oh, there it is, and yeah, a warning site signal. But when it just kept growing, we realise, oh, right, this, this, is, this is it. So I'm just going to follow on from that. So from what we've learned as a country and from, from what um, public health leaders have learned, do you think that we, we've got an infrastructure now and will we remember that infrastructure for when the next one comes? Because there will be a next one, however far away. Right. OK, here comes the career limiting part of the, the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I get worried that we get through and we move on. And I think there are some, from the announcement, there were some worrying signs for me about that. So I absolutely understand the issues around testing and testing infrastructure and all of those. But what I hear is say, right, we're going to switch it off. I can think, are we, are we, are we learning here? Is, uh, you know, what's the stand-up arrangement? Uh, how much energy are we now going to put into surveillance to make sure that we're picking these things up early? Because this whole thing was about buying yourself time to, to take actions. Well, that's really the thing that we've tried to do in less than more than anything else. Buy yourself some time so that you can you know, get testing in place or buy yourself some time so you can get your vaccination program out. Buy yourself some time. Um, and if we reduce, if we turn off 
surveillance at scale, I worry that we're going to be in a difficult situation. We are, we are one variant away from being where we were just a few weeks ago. Because there's nothing fundamentally changed. Well, what, yes, we've got vaccination. Yes, we've got all of those other things. But I think we have to, to put in infrastructure that allows us to early warn and have a rapid response and to support it in those areas to, to, to cut it off. And I think that that, for me, is, is that I don't feel like I'm assured that we're in that place now. I'll hear my card in the morning <laughs> drop. <laughs> But that gives an opportunity, certainly let's say at a local level, because at a national level it's, it's a national level, but at a local level, there, there are lessons learned, aren't there? Absolutely. So, one of the, so, so there are things that are within our gift. So for example, the contact tracing team that we had and that we piloted that was rolled out across the country. Um, the individuals in that team actually work in other parts of the local authority. The core of it works in other parts. So we, we used our customer care, our, our customer contact service to be able to put them into this. What that means is that if we are in a position where we have to stand up a rapid response, we've got the people in the team to be able to do that. You know, the, the, the fact that we, we try within the public health budget to at least carve out, we haven't got much, but we try to carve out a little bit, say if we did have to respond really, really quickly, have we got a little bit of budget that would allow us to buy ourselves some time whilst the rest of the country catches up? So those are the things that we're trying to do locally to say we can go, that we don't have to wait a week or two or three because that's where, that's where you lose it. That's where, where it's gone and you can't, you can't pull it back. You're on major catch up at that time. Brilliant. So there's a bit of a recovery. There. <laughs> um, okay, who's next? Simon, wait for the mic. Thanks, Ivan. And it, and it was a lovely story to hear, actually. It was a real, real pleasure to, to hear it. And I guess um, two bits to my question. Firstly, in, in your profile now, so certainly you, you've displaced Gary Lineker and Shawan <laughs> and, and Engelbert Humperdinck as the, as the face of, of Leicester in that way. And, and I guess t two questions out of that really. One is what that has done is raised public health, the, the profile of public health, I guess, as a specialism and how important that is in going into the future because it has. Mm. And, and I guess other directors of public health across the country as well have been you know, fairly high profile. So that's that qu question, first bit. And the second bit is, you know, from all that you said to us tonight, there's obviously a real um, story of love around Leicester and, and the city. And I guess the, the question, the second bit of the question is, has your, ha, has how you see, see Leicester and perceive Leicester changed? Is it different now in March 2022 to the way that you saw Leicester and felt about Leicester in 2019? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Simon. So, so I think the, 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 the first bit um, around the profile element is, is absolutely true um, in, in terms of me suddenly recognising, oh, people kind of know me. Um, and that's been, that has actually been great. And that's not from a, and that's not from a point of view of I want the notoriety because I don't. It is some of the things that you said before, actually. Um, members of a community that I have grown up with saying, I'm really glad that we've got a Leicester guy leading this. Or people from the, the Caribbean or the black community saying, you know what, it's really nice to see somebody that looks like me uh, being in, in, in this spot at this time. Um, and, and I found that it's really helped me to have conversations around things that I would never have had the opportunity to have conversations around. Um, as you know, Simon, education is hugely important to me. And whilst I'm a director of public health, the idea of disadvantaged groups across ethnicities being able to access education in a way that's right for them at the right time, I can have that conversation. I'm allowed to have that conversation here 
I would, I would give you credit, uh, Andy Montfort credit, which was, you know, they made me a professor before all of this happened, you know, so <laughs> well done. <laughs> so, but, but, but even with that, that, that again gets me through, through doors that I perhaps wouldn't have got through before, to be able to talk about the city, to talk about health, to talk about community. So I think, yeah, it, it, definitely, it definitely is, um, it is an opportunity and a responsibility that comes, that comes with that. And I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact that I have, to, I have to represent this city and I have to represent my community really well. I think that, that was the thing for me. I really wanted to represent us as well, that people will, will turn around and say, yeah, we've had that, but we've got a really good director of public health, you know, um, who, who represents us properly and doesn't throw us under the bus or, or anything like that. Uh, and and the, the, the second bit, the city. Um, this, this really goes back for me. Uh, I have studied elsewhere, and, and, but I've always come back home. I've always come back to Leicester. Um, it's been interesting, when you do get profile, people offer you opportunities elsewhere. And I've been really clear that the only place I've ever wanted to be a director of public health, even a reluctant one, has been Leicester. <laughs> it's the only place. So thank you for your kind offer, but no, it's, it's, it's all right. Um, it's, the, it's the place. And the reason for that, and this is the issue around a city welcoming people, and that, that goes back to my parents. My mom served as a, a nurse, a, a, a sister, a senior nurse, in UHL from the time that she was probably 21. She came over from the Caribbean. She did her training in London. She served in this city, was part of this city. My dad... Um, came, didn't even know what the place was called, Leicester, he thought it was. He had a, you know, a bit of money in his pocket. Uh, came here because other people from Antigua came here. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, he had a real emphasis around public service, a real emphasis. Even though he was a builder, he had a real emphasis about what this city provided for him. It wasn't perfect. It was a, a tough time as a migrant, but he did recognise that other places were having it far worse. My, my family, a lot of my family were in London. Their experience was very, very different to the experience that we had growing here as a city. So I've got, I had a lot of love for Leicester. But I think after this, two years later, um, my love for this city is beyond, uh, simply because I have felt supported by this city. We were having this conversation where speaking to 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 people, other directors of public health, who was, was talking about getting hate mail about some of the decisions that made and pieces, and they said, oh, it must be awful for you, because obviously you were in lockdown and people must write to you all the time, really slagging you. I said, I've had very, very little of that. I've had more, more conversations or emails or even cards from people saying, keep going, crack on you know, uh, we're behind you, we know it's difficult, than I've ever had of the, the negative. And I, I realise that has not been everybody else's experience, and I put that down to this city. I, I think they, if you're giving it your best, they can see it, uh, and, and they recognise it, and they're not going to beat you up about it. Some will, but <laughs> the vast majority won't. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Any more questions? So go with David, and then... Thank you very much. A really interesting conversation. I suppose my thoughts are really about the challenge of stakeholders. And I think as a leadership challenge, thinking how you engage with stakeholders is, is a challenging part to start with. But I think of actually the wide range of stakeholders you've had to deal with, community, businesses, multi-agencies, national, local politics, as well as actually the polarization perhaps across the pandemic of those um, constituencies. What's your leadership's thoughts, I guess, about stakeholders? And, and did it hold true, and has it adapted through the two years of the crisis, really? So thanks, thanks, thanks for that, David. I think that um, that, that piece about stakeholders and partners, and I think I said that in my, my early thing, you can, we can only deliver this through partnership. And it's interesting, because we were doing lots and lots of work prior to this around the wider determinants agenda and... And, and recognising that health is not 
locusts in hospitals or, 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 or in, in primary care and GP practice. And it's like, let me knock this door and say, uh, by the way, you know, planning or by the way, universities or by the way, have you thought about public health and your role in public health? Um, and, and while people were very polite, it was, it was quite hard to get the traction that you wanted. Uh, but now we've got this thing around partnership. And the bit that I'm, I am scared about is the fact that we will lose that. I think nationally losing it is one thing, but if we lose this locally, from a public health point of view, all of this would have been for naught because, you know, we never want to waste an opportunity here. You know, as somebody says, never waste a crisis. Um, this has been a crisis, but actually out of it, we've done things like, you know, we share data and information, which we were told before, you can't do that, you know, but suddenly, <laughs> 24 hours later, yes, we can, you know, and it's for the good of the, it's for the, good of the population. You know, I mean, I, I just have to talk to you guys here that we have an incredible working relationship that we couldn't have dreamed of two years ago. I mean, Simon and I used to sit and talk before. We, we, had, we were getting there, we were working. But now, you know, it, it, is, it is an email away. It is a call away from, can we do this? And it's like, yeah, yeah, let's look at ways that we can make this, we can make this happen. Uh, and, and you found that with the, you know, with the NHS, with police, with businesses, and all of those kind of things. And I'm thinking, OK, I know Boris has made the announcement, can, but can we just hold on to this bit, please? You know, because I just feel that we can move great things with this and we had this kind of slogan that we, we had on the masks that we were we handed out at the beginning which said Leicester together and I, I really want to hold on to that I really feel that that's hugely important about how we progress as a city and it will come through partnerships uh, and people want to do the right thing I think that's what I've learned David people want to do the right thing and they will do the right thing but we've got to be enabled to be able to do it there's got to be something that galvanizes us around it and they want to see an outcome. Brilliant. I agree. We can't lose that. And can't. I'm sure, you know, the will of the universities and, and other partners that you've identified to continue to work together, there's something for us to do there. Yeah. Definitely. There was another hand out. Okay. I know I need shorter answers, people, but I talk a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> Ivan, really, really interesting. And something I think you picked up earlier with Kushika was around, you've talked about other public health areas you'd like the conversation within Leicester to keep happening, which are key priorities still for the city post-COVID. Um, how do you now choose what that key priority is if you had to choose one? And then how do you support your team to continue focusing on that key priority when it may not be their specific specialism? Yeah, I, I think that that, that that one thing is really tough. But if you were gonna nail me down as to what it would be, it's around mental well-being. Uh, because I think it's something that reflects what we've all gone through. Um, so it, this, is, this is the spectrum, this is not, this is not the acute end of it. Um, it, it, it is, it's been the thing that we've all had to, to address, i.e. valuing it more, so people have done lots to just keep it, just to, just, and those that have kind of tipped over and, I think when you talk around mental health now, mental well-being, it's, it's very different now because we all feel that we are vulnerable uh, or, or we all feel that we're, we're dealing with something around that. Um, so that would be the one that I would pick up on. Around the team has been really fascinating because we as a public health team, like many other public health teams, had sexual health commissioners, then we had, you know, substance misuse, you know, NHS health check. So you all did your bit. This thing called COVID came along and I just said, we're all public health people, you know, <laughs> this, we're all doing this. And I have been surprised at how much people just said, yeah, we're going to go with it. You know, I, I, it doesn't matter. Whatever degree of expertise I have, that's enough for today. I will, I will share that bit with you. And I, 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 I do argue that public health has to, will, look different now than it did two years ago. If I was doing my team two years ago, it would be a, an expansion of what we already had. Now it is that ability to say, we are public health people, first and foremost. You're not a sexual health person, you're not a substance misuse, you are a public health person. So how do we now respond to this crisis? 
And I suppose my challenge is, how do I get it to the point where we collectively see this as a crisis challenge that we need to put our two pennies worth in, whatever it, that, that may be? I think that that's, that's where I want to try and head to. So that diversification of people's skills and knowledge, not, it's not only you as a leader, but that's kind of permeated throughout all of your team oh, to absolutely. enable that interaction of how they work going forward. And it has been fantastic because you have seen people in a completely new light, in a completely new way, and able to grow their abilities uh, over the course of that. So now I feel like I'd be restricting people if we were putting them back into, oh, can you be, you know, this person that just does this? Cool. So I think we had a question at the back. Yeah. A comment, first of all. Um, thanks very much for this um, wonderful talk and insight into your feelings as well as your leadership uh, skills. Um, my main concern, really, over the COVID period was about young people. Um, as a foster carer, I was trying to get the young ones to comply with some difficulty. Um, in the years ahead, whatever the challenges that are presented to us, is part of the strategy or the thinking about how we get the young people to actually take not only their health seriously but also um, their, their participation in this whole general health and, and well-being mm. agenda. I noted around the, the city there are many, many places which has got little gym areas, if I can call them that, and also during the COVID period, a lot of our community centres and other places were places where people went to um, get their jabs and so on, which I didn't see in other cities, which I'm, I'm, free, um, I'm used, well, not, not so much used to, but I didn't see in other cities. So I think we've got lots still to share with, with other cities about how we, we got to where we are now. But again, going back to, it's really, is part of the leadership thinking about how we get young people to either be the voice to encourage other young people or, or other ways. A Thank brilliant you. question. Yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really a really great question. And um, uh, I, I think that when we're young, we feel like we're immortal. You know, so when we start talking about health, that's something that you need to talk about, Ivan, because you're at that age. Um, and trying to get young people to recognise that what we do here and now and how we shape the here and now is good for you going forward is absolutely key. And I think one of the things, one of the things that COVID changed, not fully, but started us on that journey, was engagement. If I was to be candid, I think we were rubbish at engagement. I think we would, we would say, right, we're going to consult. Yeah, and we'd have, a cons we'd have a panel of people that we would consult with and we'd send out an email to our list of consultees uh, to go and, and then we'd get back the responses from those. I can guarantee you that the average age of that consulting group was at least 50, you know, that's what we got back. And so we develop our services around what we get back from that, that, that engagement group. You know, even with some of our, our younger um, groups of, that we would consult with, well, actually, those were the already engaged young people, actually, who are the people who would probably use our services anyway. COVID said, or forced us to say, you go and have the conversation over there. I remember sitting in, in, a, in a number of um, forums, and it's through the power of Zoom. Gosh, who knew about Zoom at that time? But through the power of Zoom, with, with communities, with young people saying, yeah, 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 hear what you're saying, but what about this? And what I'm concerned about is this. And it wasn't that nice, polite, you know, 
I've sent out the email, please give me your response. It was that kind of, I'm not happy with what you've done so far and you don't listen and, and we've got to go through that pain to start to engage, you know, young people and communities that we don't hear from to say, okay, what do we really want to shape? How, what does well-being really look like in our city? So one of the bits that I definitely think we've got to, be, we've got to do, we call ourselves a young city, but we don't engage at that young dimension. We've got to continue the starting point that we have with engagement going forward. And, and, and what I can say to you is we are definitely doing that within our team. We're definitely trying to, we've got a lead member who keeps saying engagement, engagement. Let's, if public health can't do it properly, who, who can? So I think that's become a really big thing. So we're not there, but we're definitely on that, that, that journey to try and be better at that. And we did find out today that, um, uh, Ivan found out that he's on Snapchat, though he didn't know what it was. It's an access to a different generation, a different population. Um, so that's the start, isn't it? It was, it was. I was so impressed. I just had to make sure it wasn't a dating site first. <laughs> So obviously engagement, I mean, it's, it's the things we talk about in the university. We have lots of young people here. Um, it's about how we engage with that younger generation. And it is absolutely going forward how we tackle public health, how we're aware of future situations and our day-to-day -day health is making sure we're educating our, our, the generations that are coming behind us. I won't necessarily say the younger ones, but the generations <laughs> coming from behind us and different engagement. Um, so, you know, are you... Do you, do you see yourself in your service exploring more of those different ways of engaging? Because as a, as a leader, it, like you say, it's not just the surveys, it's, it's now Zoom, it's Snapchat, it's whatever else is yeah, out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think one of the things, and that's why I'm, you know, the work that we've been doing with, with partners in the university, it's very much with listening ears on. Some of the expertise that, that, that resides is, it's, it's that idea that, oh, we, obviously we're public health, we know how to do this. No, we don't. You know, there, there are people that do engagement so much better than we, and we need to learn how to do that. One of the, one of the things that I saw, and, and, and David and his team were responsible for that, a couple of things twice here on the DMU site. Uh, one was when we set up, uh, they set up probably the first university-specific um, uh, screening testing centre on site here. Uh, and I know it was done by others, but the engagement piece that went around that to say, okay, you've set up a site, but this is how we're going to make it work. It's how we're going to make it work for our students, plus beyond, you know, that was the work that was done here. That, I need that kind of engagement in, in, in what I'm doing. And we also did the same when they did the, um, they did the first vaccination, university vaccination uh, on the site. And I saw uh, university students going this way, here, this, you know, it was young people engaging young people to go and have a vaccination. It was young people, not a clinician, not anybody else, saying, have you thought about having a vaccination? You know, uh, they weren't experts, but they could have the conversation with people around it. And I think it's trying to get to that place. So a lot of the work that we're starting to do now is we've, we've got some money around uh, community vaccination champions, community health champions. I really want to see that across the city and recognise that that expertise resides within communities to, to be able to engage. I can't do it at a, a, a public health level. It has to happen at that kind of community level to get it back. And what's the two-way mechanism that means that we can get the messages down that we want, but actually, quite importantly, we get the responses as to the barriers coming back up so that we can do it that way. Just got to get a lot better at that. But I think there's, there are some, some green shoots that seem to indicate that, that you know, we, we might be on that journey. Brilliant. So I'm conscious that I've kept you talking for a, an we hour, although we, we knew we would <laughs> and we could carry on. But um, it is that time of the evening now uh, that uh, it's time to close up. So I want to say thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and for your questions. Thank you so much, Ivan, for sharing the professional and the personal journey that you've had as a leader through the last two years. So we show our appreciation for Ivan spending time with us. Thank you. So we can all go outside and there's, there's some refreshments outside and you can carry on bending Ivan's ear if you like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.